Good evening. Um, I'm John Henry, Chairman of the Committee for the Republic. Um, mm -hmm. Welcome. Tonight, we're going to talk about China again. Uh, we hold more uh, salons on China than any other country. Uh, the reason is simple. Um, our relationship with China is the one that impacts our economy the most. In December, uh, Chaz Freeman, who's with us tonight, um, explained the delicate diplomacy that allowed the United States for the last half century to stay out of the Chinese civil war between China and Taiwan. Chaz explained how ruinous it would be for us to be drawn into a military conflict with China and the danger, the growing strength of China makes Taiwan the flashpoint in our deteriorating relationship with China. Tonight, Speaker Claude Prestowitz agrees that it is of vital importance for us to stay out of the war with China. But Clyde's focus is on the economics of our relationship. I know of no one who has more experience in and out of government on trade and competitiveness issues. In his new book, The World Turned Upside Down, Clyde explains how American multi American, uh, American multinational corporations got in bed with the uh, Chinese Communist Party and how, their, how the pursuit of their shareholders' interest has given China's authoritarian government the power to turn the tables on the United States. <clears throat> so Clyde is gonna tell us now uh, how the United States strikes the balance of staying out of a war with China, while at the same time, fundamentally transforming our economic relationship with China. Clyde, please tell us uh, about the failure of American policy towards China and how you think we should radically change course. Give us your vision of how we make America the workshop of the world again. And if your policy is not followed, give us confidence that President Biden will not take us to war with China as President Truman did in the Korean War without a congressional declaration of war. Clyde? Well, John, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, this is my third appearance uh, before the Committee for the Republic, and I very much have enjoyed the relationship and very much appreciate being invited to speak tonight. It's incumbent upon every author to actually show his new book. <laughs> so there it is. Um, and in the book, I, uh, this, I, I call China uh, the uh, biggest challenge uh, the United States has ever faced. Uh, including uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. Uh, people have asked me, well, why, why do I see China as that big a challenge? Uh, and the answer is that, one, <clears throat> China is a very big country, uh, and it is run by uh, the Chinese Communist Party. It, may be questionable whether it's any longer communist, but it certainly is a Leninist. So it's run by a all-powerful, all-consuming uh, political party. And it's important, I think, for us to re just review for a moment that the uh, <clears throat> head of the Chinese Communist Party or the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party appoint uh, every mayor, every provincial uh, leader, uh, every uh, CEO of a state-owned corporation, which in China accounts for about a third of the economy. Uh, there are party cells in every major company, a corporation. Um, this is a very powerful party, and the guy who heads it, in this case Xi Jinping, is a very powerful guy. I would argue he's the most powerful man in the world today. Uh, and <clears throat> this party uh, has told us uh, how it feels about, um, uh, about democracy and about uh, the values that we uh, have been living by, trying to live by and promote. Uh, in document nine of the Chinese Communist Party Congress of 2013, uh, it declared that the, the Communist Party opposes Western constitutional democracy. It opposes the concept of universal values. Uh, it opposes civil society. 
it opposes freedom of press uh, and so forth. So it's, it's, it has not made any bones about how it feels about the, our system, our values, um, and what that means to them. Secondly, <clears throat> um, the party has told us where it intends to go uh, in many respects, but particularly economically. Uh, in the five-year plan of 2015, it um, declared a project that has become well known uh, with the title Made in China 2025. Uh, and it identified the things that should be made in China by 2025, which include aviation, semiconductors, robotics, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and the whole range of uh, cutting edge, leading edge 21st century technologies. And so the, the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government are <clears throat> aiming as a matter of policy uh, and as a matter of national priority to achieve leadership uh, in this broad range of industries and to have them made in China. Uh, so we have a Leninist party combined with an economy which today, depending on how you count, is either the largest economy in the world, <coughs> excuse me, or the second largest economy in the world. Uh, in any case, it is very likely going to be the largest economy in the world sometime in the next 20 years. Uh, and so again, I underline a very, very powerful uh, combination. And I think that it's important to, um, to look at uh, how that combination has been um, impinging uh, upon the rest of the world uh, and uh, what that says about how the, where the, the country and the party uh, are pointing and where <clears throat> they are likely to go. Uh, we have already uh, seen that China, uh, we talk among ourselves about decoupling, but we have, what we have already seen is that China has been decoupling from the world in many important respects. Uh, go all the way back to uh, 1991, I think it was, we were coming to the end of the Cold War, uh, and Deng Xiaoping famously made the comment that uh, we might have to have a second Cold War. Uh, 1993, China launched a, a project to duplicate the US GPS uh, satellite communication system or the European Galileo system. It could have used either the European system or the US system, but it shot for its own system. Uh, 1997, I think a critical moment in this history, uh, when China began to build the Great Firewall, which effectively meant that it was cutting itself off from the global worldwide net. Uh, it did not allow Google into the country. It did not allow Amazon into the country or Facebook. Uh, it decoupled. <clears throat> uh, and I interpret the Made in China 2025 uh, objective as just another step uh, in that decoupling that China has been exercising from uh, the rest of the world. Now, <clears throat> if, if it were just something that affected China, that would be um, perhaps not of great concern. But we already see that China's policies and actions uh, affect uh, uh, the rest of the world quite significantly. Uh, for example, uh, we're looking today at Australia. Uh, the Australians, uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, uh, made a declaration for uh, an, an inquiry, an international inquiry into the origin of COVID. Uh, that was not what <clears throat> uh, Xi Jinping wanted. And very quickly, uh, lobsters exported from Australia to China 
began to rot on the docks in Shanghai. Um, coal from the mines in Australia stayed in the mines as the Chinese suddenly stopped buying Australian coal. Uh, Australian wine uh, was hit with a very high percent of uh, so-called anti-dumping duty. Uh, so China has been retaliating economically uh, in violation of the rules of the World Trade Organization uh, in order to teach Australia a lesson. But Australia is not the only country that has had that experience. If we go back to uh, the awarding of the Nobel Prize to Chinese Liu Xiaobo, uh, Norwegian exports of uh, salmon to China dried up. Uh, if we uh, take into consideration South Korea, the Koreans built a missile uh, detection radar on land owned by uh, Latte, a large uh, Korean conglomerate. Latte had big business in China, including 100 uh, stores scattered around uh, the Chinese landscape. Like immediately, Latte was out of business in China. Uh, <clears throat> if we look at uh, our own uh, situation, it used to be that the Dalai Lama was invited to frequently to speak at US universities. I'd be very surprised if any US university invited the Dalai Lama today. Why? Well, China does not want the Dalai Lama to be legitimized in any way. And today, <clears throat> China, major American universities are heavily dependent on Chinese students who pay full fare. Uh, they have ties with Chinese university institutions and with uh, many leading Chinese and universities uh, fear retaliation. The Hoover Institute at Stanford has published a interest, very interesting book in which it has uh, spoken with, interviewed uh, leading scholars in the US and around the world on China. And the scholars admit <clears throat> that they're very careful about what they say and to whom they say it. And, and why is that? Because in order to remain China scholars, they need to get to China. And to get to China, they need visas. Uh, and they know if they say the wrong thing to the wrong people, they may have trouble getting visas. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what I see is uh, a giant, economy run by a totalitarian party that uh, wants to project those values on the free world or wants to discipline the free world to uh, pull away or to mute those values. And I see this, this country, this party uh, using coercive measures, uh, not as a responsible stakeholder in the global liberal order, uh, but using uh, raw power and coercive measures to enforce uh, and to push uh, those objectives. And so, <clears throat> hence, I raise the question of how well can, how did we get here? How did the US manage to get into this kind of a situation? And uh, what do we need to do to respond? And <clears throat> I would say that how we got here is through uh, a combination of uh, wishful thinking, uh, badly flawed economic uh, doctrine, and corporate greed. Wishful thinking in that uh, for the past at least 30, um, maybe more like 40 or 50 years, uh, our leaders have uh, had a kind of a romantic view of China and, and particularly a view uh, that, that engagement with China and uh, trading and investing in China would somehow uh, leaven 
the communist uh, party power and somehow result one in China becoming a market economy and two in China becoming maybe not a democracy, but, but more liberal and, and, and easier to, to deal with and to integrate. Uh, that feeling best captured in a comment well known uh, initially made by Bob Zillick that we want China to be a responsible stakeholder in the liberal rules-based global order. Uh, and uh, Bill Clinton made the comment when he was president and China began to build the Great Firewall. Clinton laughed. He said, ha, ha, ha. Trying to control the internet will be like trying to nail jelly to a wall. Well, um, I would say that Jiang Zemin had the last laugh. Um, and uh, George W. Bush made the comment that uh, free trade carries the seas of democracy with it. And if we just have free trade, democracy will inevitably bloom and flourish. Uh, well, shortly thereafter, Xi Jinping came to power in China. Uh, so wishful thinking, but beyond wishful thinking, really crazy, uh, in my view, crazy economic thinking. Um, since the end of World War II, America, and I would say Anglo, because the Brits and the Aussies and the Canadians think the same way. Germans and Japanese don't, but Anglo uh, uh, economics holds that free trade is always and everywhere a win-win proposition. Uh, and that trade should be determined by what is called comparative advantage. Uh, and then thereby we maximize uh, national economic welfare and growth. Uh, and it is acknowledged that sometimes free trade results in some uh, loss of some jobs, but the argument is that the winning of the free trade, the, the greater growth of the free trade offsets the losses uh, of, of uh, dislocation. Uh, a problem is that when this doctrine was thought up by David Ricardo back in 1817, world trade was largely in commodities. There was no very little cross-border investment. Um, industries that had economies of scale were very limited. Uh, and so the doctrine does not encompass economies of scale or cross-border investment. It assumes fixed exchange rates. It doesn't uh, consider the possibility of exchange rate manipulation or, or policy. Uh, it's a very, very weak economic doctrine, but we have followed it uh, slavishly uh, since the end of World War II. Um, now, more, more recently, some economists are beginning to pull back. Paul Krugman, for example, even Larry Summers has begun to pull back from this doctrine. But it was ingrained in American uh, leaders, both economic leaders, government, political leaders, and corporate leaders. The third uh, factor, corporate greed. Uh, and I have had seen a lot of evidence of that. Uh, you know, one of the things that if you're head of think tank, which I did for a long time, uh, you, you begin the think tank thinking that you're going to think and you're going to promote thinking. But you quickly find that what you're going to do is beg for money. Uh, and you run around on bended knee uh, and try to raise funds. And where do you raise funds? Well, you raise them from people who have funds. And who are they? Rich guys and corporate leaders. Uh, so in the early 1990s, when late 80s, early 90s, when China was uh, beginning to uh, enable foreign investment and foreign participation in its markets, uh, I was close to a number of major uh, US CEOs. Uh, and they made it very clear that they uh, saw uh, a huge bonanza in the Chinese market. Uh, and for many of them, it was. Um, but particularly, they made it clear that, that not only did they think they would benefit by dint of the Chinese market itself, but also by moving their production there, they would get rid of their unions and they would get rid of their 
environmental requirements and they would get rid of uh, uh, pesky uh, local governments and it would just be a lot easier. Uh, I remember one major CEO of a semiconductor company telling me how, wow, you know, he, he really wanted to move to China because it was just so much easier for business in China than it was uh, in the US. No environmental restraints, et cetera. So anyhow, that combination got us uh, into a situation in which the US economy is now very coupled and very dependent on the Chinese economy. Uh, and we found ourselves in that situation at a moment when, as I mentioned earlier, China's behavior, both domestically in terms of Xinjiang and Hong Kong uh, and, and, uh, and abroad in terms of whipping Australia and, and threatening and, and coercing others uh, doesn't kind of fit with the continued deep integration. And so the question has come, well, what to do about it? Now, the, the immediate US response has been, and I think continues to be, we need to somehow force or convince uh, the Chinese to change and to play, quote, by the rules. Uh, and we, uh, we've had endless high-level discussions uh, beginning in, uh, right after China, even before China's entry into the WTO in 2001. Uh, and, um, and so there's been a, a, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction that we, we need to go back to China and make them play by the rules of the WTO and, and be responsible uh, stakeholders in the global system. Uh, and I have come to the conclusion that that's total nonsense. It's ridiculous. Uh, China is going to do what China wants to do. It's, it's not going to uh, change the way that it's playing. It doesn't particularly want to be a responsible stakeholder in the global uh, uh, order. And, um, and we can't force it, nor can we convince it, uh, unless we're offering something very, very uh, uh, advantageous uh, to China. Uh, so my focus is much more on uh, how do, what do we need to do ourselves to respond uh, to China. Uh, and if I look at how China got rich, it's actually no, not a secret. It's, it's, it's nothing new. It's not a miracle. Uh, China got rich the same way Germany got rich and Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore. It employed strategic industrial policy. Uh, it understood the importance of economies of scale and that economies of scale can be created and that in doing so, the comparative advantage can be changed. Uh, and so what did all these countries do? They protected their domestic market. They subsidized domestic industry. They undervalued their currency. They enforced very high savings rates, enforced low consumption domestically. And they went for export-led growth. And the big export market, of course, was the US. Uh, and so they focused on export to the US. And it worked. It worked for Germany in the 1960s and 70s. It worked for Japan in the 70s and 80s. It worked for Taiwan. It worked for Singapore. And now it's working for China. It's not a secret. Uh, the US, in fact, the US should know how to do this. Because how did we get rich? Same way, same way. Uh, between 19, uh, 1791 and uh, 1815, there was a big debate in the United States whether we should have tariffs and try to imitate the British industrialization or whether we should be a, an agricultural country of yeoman farmers, as Jefferson uh, advised, uh, and have free trade. Uh, George Washington, interestingly, was kind of in between. Um, he didn't like the idea of tariffs, but on the other hand, he did say that he himself wore only American-made clothing and drank only uh, cheese and, uh, and, and beer made in America. Jefferson was uh, strong for agricultural yeomanry, and uh, Hamilton was uh, pushing for industrialization. War of 1812, which we almost lost, convinced Jefferson that 
industry was necessary. And so from 1815 until 1950, America de protected its domestic markets, raised tariffs, subsidized industry, and became the world's leading economy. Uh, I just tell one interesting story. Woodrow Wilson, sitting in Versailles in uh, 1919, negotiating the peace, discovered that his mail was being read by the British. How was that possible? Well, British Marconi was the dominant uh, telegraph company at the time, and it had a back door. The British government had a back door into British Marconi. So Wilson was upset, and he called in his secretary of the Navy, a guy named uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he said, Frank, we need to beat British Marconi. And so Frank saluted, and he went out and he called in uh, United Fruit, AT&T, Westinghouse, uh, and said, okay, gentlemen, you with the U.S. Navy are going to be shareholders in a new corporation aimed at beating British Marconi. The name of that corporation is RCA. Um, many people today, if I go to an audience and ask them who invented the internet, they'll tell me uh, Bill Gates uh, or uh, Jeff Bezos. Very few people understand that the internet was invented by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, the US government. The semiconductor industry owes its life to the US government. Everything that Apple sells, everything that Apple sells, US government origin, DARPA origin. So the US knows how to play this game. And my plea is that we begin to play. Uh, and my argument would be that we should attempt to reshore or to diversify uh, the production of U.S. and other multinational companies away from China and back to the U.S. or to Mexico or to India uh, or wherever, uh, but reduce our dependence. This is not uh, total decoupling, but it's a reduction of dependence. Um, and it's a response to Made in China 2025. Uh, I think that we need to relook at our whole macroeconomic package. Uh, when I was young, uh, tax rates on rich people in the United States were very high, over 90%. Uh, Ronald Reagan complained that he was working for the government most of the year as a well-paid actor. Uh, but Reagan had a pretty good life working for the government oh, most of the year. Uh, the, gaps between rich and poor in the U.S. were much less when I was a kid than they are today. I think we need to get aim at getting back more to the uh, lesser uh, gap between rich and poor. Um, we need to invest a lot more in infrastructure, research and development. One of my proposals is that we impose a market access charge uh, on incoming investment into the U.S. Um, <clears throat> It's interesting, you know, the U.S., uh, there's one product that only is made by the United States that the world wants. It's the U.S. dollar uh, or investment in the U.S. because it's safe and it's easy to get in and out. Uh, and so my argument is let's impose a charge, 2 3% of the amount of the investment coming into the U.S. unless it's going into greenfield new production capacity. In that case, fine, let's have it come in without charge. But with charge, a 2 or 3% charge on incoming investment would effectively weaken the dollar, would reduce the U.S. trade deficit, would encourage domestic production uh, and domestic activity. Uh, I can go on, but the point is that the U.S. needs to in really look at what China does. Uh, China, I, I admire the Chinese. The road and belt uh, project is, it's, it's uh, uh, genius. Uh, uh, I admire them for what they're doing. I admire how they're running their economy. I'd like to do more of that myself. Uh, and I think that we can do that without uh, going to war. We can do that without uh, having to be uh, extraordinarily uh, antagonistic. In fact, I think of this as kind of like Michael Corleone. You remember at one point in the movie of The, the Godfather, Michael says, look, look, it, it's, you know, it's just business. It's not personal. It's just business. I think the Chinese understand business. 
And I think we should be able to have that kind of relationship with China uh, that would be protecting our interests, our wealth creation cap capability, maintaining our technological leadership, uh, and uh, let China do the best they can. Thank you very much, and I hope that I've stirred some uh, questions. <clears throat> Uh, Clyde, I have a couple uh, questions. First, an observation. Wasn't it true that um, Alexander Hamilton created this group at the outset of the uh, uh, U.S. government operations, that he's going to be manufacturers that were going to identify the sunrise and sunset industries and all make the United States grow? And it went bankrupt after 10 or 15 years because they weren't as prescient in seeing the market as they may be thought. Uh, but another observation is, you know, the Chinese generally are despised in all these countries that they invest in. You go to the countries with, all throughout Africa, Latin America, they say that they come in, they bribe everyone, and they have enemies everywhere. If there's such a wonderful model to emulate, why would it be only the United States that's resisting the model and elsewhere? Uh, they're pushed back, you know, unless they've the country already has uh, the ability, the, an inability to push back because they need the Chinese borrowed money. So, Bruce, um, I, I'm, you know, Hamilton uh, introduced, of course, the first uh, uh, tariffs, which financed the U.S. government uh, for most of its history until 1950 or 1930s. Uh, and Hamilton, in fact, Jefferson swung over to Hamilton's side after the War of 1812 because it turned out that the U.S. couldn't make the equipment it needed and, and almost lost the war. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at U.S. history, I mean, um, the Homestead Act was uh, a huge industrial policy to uh, get the Midwest being farmed. The railroads were a huge industrial policy. Uh, to advance railroads. Uh, Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, raised tariffs on steel sky high. Uh, he was criticized for making steel too expensive, but he responded by revealing a knowledge of the economies of scale by saying, no, 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 uh, we have the biggest market and our producers will begin outproducing in quantity other producers and we'll have the lowest prices and that's what happened. Uh, I can go on and on, but I mean, you get to, the U.S. became the biggest, most richest economy in the world by dint of industrial policy. But you're, you're uh, saying, you're, I think it's partly, you, I think you're arguing something like post hoc ergo propter hoc. Maybe it's true X happens and then Y happens afterwards, but the causal nexus isn't always there just because it happened afterwards. It could have happened irrespective of the government effort. And my well, observation said, about Hamilton wasn't about his imposing tariffs. He established a group of manufacturers supposed to have all the wise men's wisdom that you've now attributed to the Chinese and somebody who's going to come in and knows all the future of the economic development is going to say, these are the sunrise, these are the sunsets, and this is what we need to do. I think that's the opposite of certainly our creed. With You must disagree with Adam Smith when he said, you know, any legislator who thought he could direct the uh, private man and how he should invest his capital uh, would be very dangerous and he'd really be a lunatic. He thought he would could exercise that responsibility in any kind of sensible way. Are you disputing all of uh, this, the premise of, uh, of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations? Not all of it, but some of it. Uh, Smith didn't live in an industrialized world. He didn't know anything about economies of scale. Uh, in fact, he made exception for, uh, for war, uh, products that, that are involved in national defense. But look, uh, it's not just the US experience. Every country that has ever gotten rich, the UK, the US, every country that is not an oil country that has gotten rich, UK, US, the European countries, Japan, Korea, it's all the same thing. It's the same story, Bruce. So, uh, but but what, well, did, you, did you think when Britain abolished the corn laws and the free trade, the Cobden and Bright, when their policy became a Senate in Britain, then you think fall into the economic doldrums? This was, no, that was when, that was when Britain began America. to go downhill. That what? was when Britain began to go downhill. Britain pursued uh, per pure industrial policy from about 1450 until 1845. Uh, in 1845, Britain was the world's leading producer of steel and railroads, etc. By 1870, they were behind us and the Germans who subsidized those industries. 
By 1900, they were way behind. By 1918, they were a second-rate country. Uh, I mean, it's it's not it's not even a. Uh, but, but, but part of that, I, I, my argument would be, it's because they're spending 80 percent of their budget on the military, trying to run the whole world. Well, you know, if you look at the British budget as a percent of GDP, it was very small. <clears throat> Can we have other people ask a question? <laughs> I have a question. Um, I'm Pat Malloy. I, I was general counsel of the Senate Banking Committee, and then I was on the China Commission for 10 years, but we went to China every year at the think tank for Congress on China. And let me just lay out something that I think very important to this discussion. When Deng Xiaoping got power in 78, he said, in order to build our comprehensive national power, which means you build your technological, industrial, and then you build your military and political base. In order to do that, you need foreign investment, foreign technology, foreign markets, and foreign know-how. So the, the key then is how to incentivize that into your country. The other thing that happened, and I saw it on the Senate Banking Committee, in the 80s, we moved in this country from stakeholder capitalism to shareholder capitalism where these corporations and the Wall Street guys who were driving this process, met, these corporations felt their only responsibility is to enrich their shareholders. And they tied their own compensation to their ability to do so. We tried to get legislation under, under a Chairman Proxmire to slow down that process. We got it out of committee, couldn't get it on the floor. So what I saw is that the Chinese recognized this and they offered our corporations a chance to make a hell of a lot of money for their shareholders and themselves, the top guys and the Wall Street guys. And they did it because our government had no problem with it. Well, what they did, we, we built China's comprehensive national power. And uh, that's the problem that we now face in this country. And the question is how to deal with that problem. And Clyde, you're laying out some very good ideas, but I think it's very important that you have to understand that the interest of our corporations in Wall Street diverge from the national interest. And what part of what we have to do in this country is to re-incentivize our own corporations in Wall Street to get back on our team. Well, interestingly, Pat, in that regard, it's very interesting to look at, at China. I, I think we can learn from China in this. Um, Jack Ma, the richest guy in China, just got taken down by Xi Jinping. And, you know, uh, Xi, Xi was not going to let Jack mess around <laughs> with the Chinese economic policy too much. Uh, now, contrast that with a guy like Tim Cook. Tim Cook is, uh, of course, chairman of, uh, of Apple. And, uh, everything that Apple makes is made in China. Everything that Apple makes also came out of the U.S. government lab. Tim has transformed an enormous amount of technology and investment and jobs to China, and Apple's making money hand over fist. But I wonder if Xi Jinping would have done to Jim, Tim Cook what he just did to Jack Ma. Uh, and, you know, I remember when, um, uh, when GE moved its uh, operation, they moved its... Uh, avionics business into uh, AVIC uh, in, in Shanghai. And uh, Jeff Immel was the chairman of GE and he was at a party with, uh, or at a meeting. He was also chairman of Obama's committee on jobs and, uh, and uh, growth. And, uh, you know, and he, he, he had this avionics division. Avionics is not labor intensive. He moved it to China because the Chinese made it clear to him if he wanted to sell avionics in China, he had to make them in China. And yet, at the same time, he was the head of Obama's commission on jobs. And I wonder if he ever had a chat, if, if Obama ever called him up. I'm sure Xi Jinping would have called him up. <laughs> you want to live in a country where a president can do that? I'm sorry? Clyde, Clyde, do you want to live in a country where a president can issue orders and make law by a telephone call? I think that I don't have to have that kind of dominance to have a greater sense of, there was a time, Bruce, in our, in our history 
when corporate leaders had a sense of responsibility to the nation. Uh, that's gone. Uh, I remember when, when I was a young man, I had a scholarship given by Tom McCabe, a Scott paper company. And on McCabe's wall was a list of the job of a CEO. And you know, the first was make the best product. And next was take care of your workers. Next was take care of your community, take care of your state, take care of your country. The council, the uh, business roundtable had that same list in 1980. In 1993, the business roundtable changed that to your job is to make profits, returns for your shareholders, mainly in the short term. I think that we don't have to have a dictator in order to have a better uh, discipline and a better uh, balance in our corporate law. <clears throat> but why do you think human beings in the government are acting differently in terms of their motivation than human beings in the corporate sector? They change the DNA change when they get into government. I don't follow your question. I'm sorry. Yeah, wh why do you think? Why do you think? Because you happen to be working for the government, you could be elected or appointed, that you're going to have the the interests of, of the United States and the people rather than being reelected in power and looking at your own ambitions in the foremost it's concerns governing your behavior. It's just, it's but it's right out. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I've lost the discussion here. Yeah, could I, this is Paula Stern and Clyde, thank you and John Henry um, uh, for this discussion. And I have to say that Clyde and I go back a long way uh -huh. and that uh, there was- You still look young to me, Paula. <laughs> uh, yeah, but there was a time I have to say when uh, you and I would debate whether Japan was 10 feet tall or not. Right. And I would insist they weren't. Right. And I want to say, however, that as Stalin would say, the Soviet Union is not Albania, nor <laughs> is Japan China. And it is a completely different situation. And we're in a particularly different moment in time. And I think that your presentation has been very interesting. I have not seen your specifics on your proposals. But I would like to ask a specific about something that you did mention tonight, Clyde, exchange rates. And I thought I'd like you to address that because I have been involved in a number of business debates the last couple of days about the issue of uh, a national recovery from both economic and from our pandemic. And one of the big arguments that business people, they happen to be men, are making is that we are um, endangering the value of the U.S. dollar, that somehow it needs to stay strong, and that by giving uh, relief, according to the proposals coming out of the White House, this would weaken the dollar and it would be fiscally irresponsible according to these business leaders. I'm wondering if you will relate what your industrial policy, which includes exchange rate issues, um, uh, recommendations are vis-a-vis -vis China to where we are here in the United States, in this in globe, right. uh, with the pandem pandemic and with economics. The US dollar is the question, the strength. Yeah. So, uh, Paula, uh, thanks, and good to see you again. Um, look, if, you're, if you are uh, a buyer, if you're Walmart and you're buying a lot of stuff from China to come to the US, um, if you are, uh, a Wall Street firm and you're looking to invest uh, abroad, uh, you want a strong dollar. If you're a worker and you want a job and you want to make something in the US, you'd rather not have such a strong dollar. Uh, now, unfortunately, our politics tends to be influenced much more by Wall Street uh, and, and by big global corporations than, than by workers. Um, and I mean, while I'm on this line, let me just bring up another point that's kind of attached to it. Um, 
we call these companies American companies, Apple, Ford, GM, and so forth. We call them American companies. They're not. They are not. Uh, they may be chartered in the state of, typically the state of Delaware. Uh, but they, in Washington, they're powerful. You know how powerful they are in Washington. Armies of lobbyists and lawyers, big bucks to politicians. Um, they have instant entree to policymakers. They write law. Um, in Beijing, they're on their knees. They kowtow just like everybody else. And not just in Beijing, but in many other capitals where they operate, they or they don't have power. So, you know, I always had a choke when I would see people from the Chamber of Commerce or the Business Roundtable or some of these CEOs were talking about testify before Congress. And they would talk about how they were the voice of American business. They're not. Tim Cook is much more the voice of China than he is the voice of American business. He's much more afraid of what she can do to him than he is of what Biden can do to him. Uh, this whole thing about the dollar is nonsense. Uh, the dollar is the world's reserve currency, and it's going to be that way for quite some time. The Chinese would like to have the, the RMB be more of a world currency. Maybe someday it will be. But for the foreseeable future, the dollar is the currency. Um, let's go back to Bretton Woods. The, let's go back to you know, when we set up the free trade system. At, in Bretton Woods in 1944, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, greatest economist of the 20th century, called for a system in which countries that had chronic trade surpluses would have tariffs imposed on their exports in order to achieve balanced trade country by country, not balanced trade around the world, but country by country. That was Keynes. Uh, and, you know, he's a pretty good economist. So that's kind of where I, that's where my MAC, my market access charge would tend to push things. It would tend to push towards a greater balance in global trade, not just for the U.S., but globally. Well, I, it, it's Paul Horn. I'd like to follow up on what Paula said, and that is about the dollar. There's a fundamental economic identity between savings and investment, which right. the U.S. has allowed to become unbalanced for the last 30 years, in effect national savings rate, both personal and corporate and public, right. is inadequate to finance our investment. And we've been fortunate that most countries, most other countries with major surplus savings have found the U.S. a better place to invest in. And the two principal sources of financing our government deficit and savings deficit have been, since the 19, late 1980s, have been Japan, first of all, and China and they continue to be the principal sources of financing. So how would you encourage the American household and corporation, which you correctly identified as being responsible for the outsourcing, to return to the US and save enough to uh, right, reestablish that equilibrium? Second question, as I might. Oh, that's a big question already. <laughs> yeah, yeah your, 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 your reference to RCA and ARPAs implies an activist government, which the conservatives in the United States have argued against and successfully created an anti-government, anti-tax, anti-regulatory environment, which discourages those greedy corporations from returning to the US. Thank you. Yeah, let me answer your last question first. You're exactly right. Uh, we have encouraged uh, Robert Barron's uh, and we ought to stop. Um, to your first question, uh, are you familiar with Mike Pettis at the uh, at Peking University in China? Uh, you should read. When we get done here, go online and, and Google Mike Pettis. So Mike's argument, and I agree with Mike, uh, is uh, kind of the reverse. Mike is saying, hey, you know what? All this foreign money coming into the US, it's not coming in to finance our trade deficit. Uh, in fact, it's forcing our, it forces our, it forces us on a, a, to have a trade deficit and it forces our savings rate lower. Uh, and he says, you know, if it were coming in to finance the trade deficit, it would exactly equal the trade deficit, but it doesn't, it's much greater. And so Mike's argument is, and I agree with Mike's argument, we don't have to beg for foreign investment. It comes, we have too much. Uh, and less foreign investment would trigger 
higher savings and higher investment in the U.S. Um, and of course, uh, a, a, a lower uh, a dollar exchange rate. And I, I think Mike is on, on to something there. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Tom Hanshaw. I used to work uh, at the World Bank. Occasionally, I was dealing with China. But one of the questions I have for you is, it seems that the U.S. under Trump was dealing with China one-on-one. -on -one. And there, there appears to me a, a huge opportunity for the Biden administration to come up with a coalition to deal with the various problems related to China. And I would be curious to get your thoughts about how you would build a coalition uh, to deal with, with these right. problems? Because, I mean, that's really, it's a way of leveraging uh, the U.S. position vis-a-vis -vis China. And, and Bruce mentioned that there's a tremendous amount of Chinese, I mean, hostility toward the Chinese. So the, the possibility of developing a worldwide coalition to deal with this problem is, yeah. uh, me, strikes me as a, as a huge opportunity. Right. So um, I, I was, you know, often asked uh, how I felt uh, about the Trump uh, policy toward China uh, or Trump policy more generally. And the, the reply I often gave was that, um, you know, even if you really dislike Trump, um, everything he's, he says everything in the wrong way, but everything he says is not wrong. So I felt that with regard to China, he was fundamentally right, but he really said it and kind of acted it the wrong way. And, and I am a supporter of let's talk to our allies and try to get our allies on board and try to, to go to China with kind of a united front. I, I think that, you know, it, it's always better to have friends with you. Uh, if, if they really support you, it's better to have friends than to go alone. But there is an element here that I think we have to be very careful and, about and conscious of. So um, during the writing of my book, I traveled around the world and interviewed a lot of people. One of them was a, a top leader in Singapore. And he said to me, look, Clyde, you know we love you guys. You, you know, we let you use our port here for the Seventh Fleet. We want you to be, stay here in the Pacific. I said, look, I got to be realistic. You know, my economy, my biggest export here in Singapore is tourism and the tourists come from China. My second biggest export is education and the students come from China. And he says, I know that they could be weaponized because I've watched the Chinese weaponize them. So he said, you know, I got to be careful here. Uh, and I can't just salute to Uncle Sam. Then I go to Australia and I met with a top banker in Australia, older guy. And he says to me, well, you know, Clyde, we were with the Brits in uh, World War I and with you guys, World War II, Vietnam, Korea. Afghanistan, but he said, if there's any dust up over Taiwan, don't look for us on the beach. Well, why not? Hey, our biggest export is, is uh, iron ore, it goes to China. Second is coal, it goes to China. Third is education, students from China. Fourth is tourism, tourists from China. They can be weaponized. We gotta be careful. Uh, Europeans, what did Angela Merkel just say? She doesn't want blocks. Uh, she just signed a treaty, an investment treaty, uh, push that through the, uh, the EU uh, with China. Uh, and, and um, you know, I think that deal might be, might be uh, denied by the EU parliament, I'm not sure. But the point is, and Macron, in fact, just about an hour ago, I was looking at the screen here, and Macron was speaking about European aut strategic autonomy and how Europe has to be independent and have its own you know, its own strategy and, and uh, not salute to the U.S. So I think we need to recognize that the interests of our allies are not necessarily ours. Mm -hmm. Angela Merkel wants to sell Mercedes and BMWs in China, uh, and she doesn't want to be part of any American, not much part of any American united front toward China. Now, she's a little, uh, she's a little uh, unsettled because she didn't like the Chinese buying KUKA, the, the robotics company in Germany. Right. But, you know, if we are constrained, if, if we decide that we're going to accept the lowest common denominator of our allies, we won't do anything. So I, I think, you know, we need to talk to the allies, but I don't think we can allow them to control our policy. So the Chinese are a bit like the British imperial power in the uh, 1800s. 
Well, they kind of are. Uh, and I mean, you know, I, you think of the Roman Empire, all roads lead the Rome, well, now all roads are leading to China. <laughs> Mike, could I ask you about um, how you would deal with corporations? Yeah. If you say that uh, Apple is uh, more the voice of China than loyal to the United States, right. what would you right. do with those companies? Would you right. restrict United States investment in China? Would you restrict Chinese investment in the United States? Yeah. I'm glad you asked that question. It's a really great question. Um, let, let me start by saying that um, that I understand the position of the CEOs in a way. I, for a long time, I was uh, on uh, Intel's advisory board and I knew Andy Grove very, very well. I was a good friend of Andy Grove. Now there was not, nobody, you know, Andy having been a refugee from Hungary, come to the US without a penny and, and, <clears throat> and you know, live the American dream. And he was more Catholic than the Pope. He was more American than the Americans. And I remember once we were at a meeting uh, in uh, the Valley with uh, about a hundred CEO, a uh, hundred uh, Intel executives from around the world. And Andy gave a speech, a very pro-American speech. And while he was speaking, I could feel the discomfort in the room. And I, I realized, wow, these CEOs did these, these high ranking Intel executives, you know, and he's making them uncomfortable. Uh, and, and then later, about a week later, Andy actually wrote a, uh, an apology to his own guys uh, for being kind of super uh, pro-America. So if you're the head of a global corporation, you really can't have a nationality. I understand that. So I'm not trying to pick on Tim. I understand he's, you know, where he stands. But then I say, okay, but then that means that the nation in which that company is chartered needs to somehow change the game to force him to take more into consideration the concerns and the needs of this country. And mind you, this, I, the, I use the, Intel ex, the uh, Apple example because in 1982, I was sitting in my office at the Commerce Department and my assistant came into my office. He said, hey, Steve Jobs is calling you. And I laughed. I said, are you kidding me, Steve Jobs? No, no, it's Steve Jobs. So I took the phone and sure, it was Steve Jobs. And Steve at that time was having trouble selling in Japan and he wanted help. And so I went out, met with him and his guys and we put together a program. And we kind of got Steve into Japan. So when I look at Tim and I hear the things he say, I remember Steve. <laughs> and, you know, when American corporations want the American government, boy, they're, they, they call themselves American corporations. They demand a lot from the U.S. government. They expect a lot. Well, they should be willing to, to, to play it both ways. So here, what, here's what I would do. Uh, first, I wouldn't, I wouldn't restrict their, uh, their ability let, let me, let me uh, qualify that. Uh, basically, I wouldn't restrict the ability to invest outside the US. Now, there are areas where I might. Uh, I think that the, the, the China has this made in China 2025. We need to, die, in my view, we need to be sure that the United States states and the free world, let's say the free world, stays in the lead in those technologies. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure we stay in the lead in those technologies. And that might mean some restriction on investment under national security uh, law. But put that aside, that's a narrow part of what we're talking about. What I would rather do is to do it this way. Uh, let's remember that corporations are ungrateful. Corporations need a charter in order to be a corporation. And they get it from the state. The state is giving them a huge gift. It's giving them limited liability. Without limited liability, they couldn't do it. Why does the state do that? It does it because it expects the corporation is gonna do something that will benefit the community. Corporations have forgotten that, but they owe the state, they owe the community something. And so what I would do is I would say, okay, any corporation that is, let's say has a billion and a half dollars in sales, and that does 20% of its business outside the US, in addition to having a Delaware charter, or a California charter, gotta have a federal charter uh, granted by the state, by the 
the, the Department of Commerce. And the federal charter will have some teeth in it uh, about what the what should govern the corporation in terms of its foreign investment and and uh, tech transfer of technology and so forth. Second thing I would do is I would change the incentives. Right now, if, if you're the head of an American multinational, right now, uh, Singapore is probably knocking on your door. Uh, let's say that you're in, uh, you're in uh, artificial intelligence. I'm sure Singapore is knocking on your door, the, the Economic Development Board in Singapore, and they say, hey, you know, if you came to Singapore, we'd give you the land free and uh, we train the workers. So that's, that's all part of the package. No taxes for 20 years uh, and, uh, you know, a deal. Um, and I'm sure that, that uh, and, you know, they have labor unions in Singapore, but not very strong labor unions. And other countries, Ireland is doing the same thing. Um, and China's got this huge market and it's got all this data. You really want data if you're in artificial intelligence. Uh, and the Chinese saying, hey, come on over here. No labor, you just don't worry about that stuff. And you know, people will do what they say, what, what we tell them to do. Uh, and they'll work on Saturdays and Sundays and they'll bring their kids in to help if they need to meet the deadline. And hey, by the way, you know, 50% uh, on our utilities and uh, capital grant uh, and, um, I mean, unbelievable package. We don't do that. Well, it's time to start. Our states do it, but the states don't have the, they don't, they, they regulate state taxes, but national taxes, they don't have anything to say about it. They don't have enough, most states don't have enough money to offer any kind of a decent capital grant or capital subsidy. Uh, we're not playing the game. Uh, and I would just look at what the Chinese do and match it. <clears throat> Clyde, it seems to me there's an inconsistency um, in your theory, because on the one hand, you say the corporations have access to all the American politicians, they make the campaign contributions, they have the, especially Citizens United, they have all the PAC money. So they walk up and they write the legislation and whatever. Whereas, and that's why they're more fearful in China, because they could go out of business the next day if they antagonize Z, because he has limitless power. So why, since at least at, as we're speaking now, the corporations and the moneyed interest, the 1% dominate politics, the political power that would make the decisions that you're describing that you would think would make us a much more powerful economic uh, country. Why don't you think the corporations would control that process? It's not gonna be Clyde Prestowitz. It's gonna be Tim Cook and Zuckerman or whatever with all this staggering money. Well, you didn't. Bruce, money you didn't. Yeah, you didn't get my whole program, so let me let me give you the rest of it. Okay, in in the uh, in in the America under the under Clyde Prestowitz, corporations would be treated as they are in Canada. They would be they would not be able. Only real people would be able to make a corporate contribution. That's what they do in Canada. Uh, so in the U.S., corporations would not make political donations. But how do you get a law to be passed? That? How do you how do you make a law that's going to pass that? You can't just decree it as Clyde Prestowitz. How is this political system, which you know would never contemplate that statute in a million years? No way. Well, Bruce, um, you you make me out as a dreamer, but uh, you have a lot of experience of being a dreamer. And I mean, you, your stands on many issues, are, I understand them, but no, they're kind I, of, I understand uh, they are dreams. Kind of romantic, right? I'm true in my oh, life. So give me a little romance, okay? <laughs> I just want to point it out. I'm not faulting okay. you. I listen. Right. The problem is overwhelming. I'm not faulting you that you don't have a panacea. Nobody okay, else. Here, you can try this for example. So right now, you know, uh, CEO of Intel or Apple goes before Congress and he says, "I'm the CEO of of uh, whoever I am." Or uh, Tom Donovan goes before Congress. He used to, I guess he's done now, but he used to say he's the voice of American business. Well, uh, if I look at, you know, your board and I look at how many of your companies are big in China, or I look at you, you're big in China. I don't think you're the voice of American business. You shouldn't be allowed to say that. You, 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 ought, to be, you ought to have to identify yourself that you, your basic business depends on China. You ought to have to say that. <clears throat> We still not hearing anybody. Everybody's muted except me. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay.
Well, I have a question. Yes. Uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, so, um, you know, Pew uh, came out with a survey recently that um, um, marked how there is a fundamental disagreement. It's not policy. It's about the fundamental facts. Mm -hmm. that it, what are the bases for our opinions? And, and it was really quite, quite a startling survey, uh, yeah. survey result. Um, the, the question is, um, so we have an opportunity. Uh, we're, we're coming out of a pandemic, we hope. We're um, probably on the verge of coming out of a recession, if not a depression, in terms of as measured by unemployment. What could we do right now to stimulate and instigate government participation in furthering that recovery? What would be the, I mean, infrastructure is bandied about. What, what would be, say, the top three initiatives? Uh, I, I don't like to call it industrial policy, but what would be the three initiatives? that the government should heavily invest in both to pull us out of the recession and the hang from the pandemic and make us more competitive against China. Right. right. So, um, of course, infrastructure is a major, is a major one. The second one is uh, my proposal of putting an access, uh, a so-called market access charge uh, on incoming investment. That would by the way, that the money that was gained from that excess charge would go to an infrastructure development fund. So you could you could handle or address the dollar problem, and at the same time create ammunition to deal with the infrastructure problem. Uh, second thing is we we spend about two percent of our GDP on R and D. Korea is spending four percent. China is getting to about 3%. We, we ought to be at 4%. Uh, now, uh, in the US, about 1.5% is government and about 2.5%, uh, what's it, 1% uh, is, is uh, industry. We uh, ought to have uh, government substantially increasing spending on R&D. But I think that we need to have um, a a real program of, of reshoring. So think about this. Um, it's not, it's not, you know, China is not really a cheap, wa low wage country. Um, manufacturing is no longer labor intensive. Uh, robotics and, and electronics have made manufacturing, real, I mean, a semiconductor factory doesn't have a lot of people, but it pays high wages. If you're a governor, you want semiconductor factories. They pay high wages and they buy a lot of stuff. Uh, and we don't have any method in either in uh, funneling investment or you know, gathering and funneling investment uh, or using it in a way that generates ongoing uh, advance, technological advance and ongoing growth of production. Um, manufacturing in the US accounts for about 9% of GDP. In Germany, it's 20. In Italy, it's 19. In Japan, it's about 19. Those are not low wage countries. Uh, we ought to be able to do the same thing. Manufacturing creates wealth. Walmart doesn't create wealth. Uh, and we need to focus on that kind of wealth creation, in my view. <clears throat> Yeah, the problem is that infrastructure spending, building better roads and bridges isn't going to make us more competitive with China. It'll make our lifestyle better. <laughs> but um, the question is, what, what should we focus our... Well, infrastructure is not roads and bridges. Infrastructure is telecommunications, it's water, it's satellites, it's all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So I see, Chaz, uh, Chaz you had uh, your hand up here. Um, why don't you join the conversation um well i'll just say on infrastructure to begin with that um uh, there have been repeated meetings abroad usually chaired by japan about what to do about the inadequacy of american infrastructure uh we're just not competitive in that area and um so i accept clyde's very broad definition of it and i would include education in that uh, we have an inferior education system uh, that is not educating people for the modern work, workplace. 
and that's the problem. Uh, what I really like about Clyde's analysis, I'll say at the outset, um, you know, I think it's okay that Clyde vents about various political misdemeanors that China creates. Um, if the Chinese bully the Koreans or Australians, they pay a price. Uh, let them pay the price, is my view. Um, the issue really is, will tearing China down make the United States more competitive? And the answer is clearly no. Um, it wasn't Chinese corporations that decided to outsource. Uh, it was management committees in American corporations where labor has no voice. Uh, so when they confront a competitive situation, unlike German corporations where labor is represented, their immediate reaction is to dump the workers and go for low wages abroad. We have a lot of structural problems and Clyde is trying to address those. And I happen to agree with him, um, although I know Bruce doesn't, that much of American economic history is explainable by um, sound government policies that focused on the development of key industries, whether it was railroads, whether it was canals before that, whether it was um, the uh, aviation industry, which was sponsored by the post office of all places. They put out postal stamps for airmail before there was any possibility of airmail. And they created an industry and one can go on. Uh, but um, so I think uh, the question we're dealing with is not really about China, it's about ourselves. We've made the mess we're now in. If China didn't exist, Vietnam or somebody else would have come along or uh, Europe, um, as Trump observed, you know, Europe is the enemy. Um, we, uh, we need to fix our own problems and we're not dealing with them. Uh, we're in denial, we're demonizing others, and we're, you know, we're saying, okay, we're all screwed up, but the devil made us do it. And who's the devil? China. But that isn't an answer. Uh, we need to reform our tax policies, our labor management system, our capital markets. We need to definancialize our economy. We need to reindustrialize it. And I think Clyde is commendable for dealing with all these things. And I I'd finally note that it's impossible for the United States to remain in the lead in science and technology if we're not open. If we restrict immigration, if we stop importing brains, if we are close to foreigners and their ideas, we're going to lose. Um, and uh, it's interesting to me that the Chinese seem to have figured that out. Um, I don't understand why we have so. My comment is, hooray, Clyde, keep up the good work. Thank you. <clears throat> but don't you think China's policies in Hong Kong are driving away uh, the kind of genius and talent you just described, Chaz? They're driving away political um, people who are up upset about losing their ability to give China the finger, which is essentially what the demonstrators did. They were arguing for Hong Kong independence. Um, we weren't very kind to South Carolina when it did that a while back. Um, so, uh, no, I, the, the Hong Kong stock market, Hong Kong investment is experiencing a boom. Um, some people may be leaving, but a lot of money is moving in. And so uh, I think that is uh, a case of theory before facts, Bruce, frankly. Well, Chaz, to associate Fort Sumter, which was fired on to preserve slavery with Hong Kong that's demanding freedom is a little bit odd. I don't find the analogy very close. Well, I'm, I wouldn't uh, want to uh, explore the analogy too far, but I'd note that Hong Kong, <laughs> Hong, Kong had an obligation, Hong Kong had an obligation to pass a law protecting one China in addition to two systems. China had an obligation to protect two systems. Hong Kong allowed demonstrators to attack one China. People mooned the Chinese anthem at stadiums. They burned flags. They, and eventually they got into a level of vandalism that we have only recently begun to experience in this country. And we find it intolerable. And the Chinese found it intolerable. 
and after giving Hong Kong 20 years to pass the law it was obligated to do, they imposed a law, which is tragic. I don't at all agree with what has been done, but I understand why it was done, and it was not done uh, frivolously or in great haste. And I think taking ideological stance on Hong Kong is great, but let's look at the facts. And the fact is the place is booming. If, if I could jump back in, I just want to, uh, people have to understand that we've run about four, over $4 trillion with trade deficits with China. The GDP formula says when you run negative next net exports, you detract from your GDP and job growth. So what happened here is our corporation, and this, and this is why I'm with Chaz and Clyde, our biggest problem is changing what we're doing. Now, these corporations, because they moved into the, the shareholder value system, they could be incentivized to transfer jobs, and they transferred millions of jobs from here to China. And, we, and that's what caused these massive and ongoing trade deficits, which then destroyed communities across the country and workers and their families, which I think led to some of the political problems we're having in this country right now. So um, I remember uh, Ken Lieberthal, he was the guy on the NSC staff under President Clinton who pushed to bring China into the WTO. Ken Lieberthal later wrote a book about advising American corporations how to do well in China. But he, in that book, he said that when legislation is being considered in the US government, these corporations are often leaned on by the Chinese government to come up and testify against that legislation. Now, that's not China's fault. They're playing the game to their advantage. That's us. And these are things we have to change. And that's why Clyde's book is so important and what Chad said is so important. We have met the enemy, as they all say, and it's us. And we got to change us, not change China. Our job is to change us so that we compete in this global economy and stop this political paralyzation of our country that's just ripping, up, ripping us apart. We have a global trade and balance of tra payments deficit. We do, you know, China is part of that. But if China disappeared, as we've just seen with the Trump experiment with tariffs, quotas, and American-style mercantilism, um, people just move to Vietnam. You know, they don't come back here. Now why? We need to think about that. What is it that we need to do to reattract our own capitalists to us? It seems to me that it's not just finding a, an ideal or a superior policy. You have to find ways to get the people who wield the power that make the policy have an incentive to do it. Uh, you know, we are not going to have, in the short run, I hope, ruled by platonic guardians. If you don't address how we elect and give people power and who is going to occupy those positions, uh, you can have all the greatest ideas in the world and they're not going to go any place because it's still going to be the corporate interests and the money interests that are control the people who actually have the power to make the policy, which is what we've seen for time immemorial. Some people think that MAGA stands for morons are governing America. <laughs> <laughs> I see uh, Ralph Gomery, I, I see you. You're on mute, you gotta unmute yourself, Ralph. Ralph, you got to unmute. Yeah, there you go. You hear me? Okay. Yeah. I want to uh, agree very strongly. I have all, I will not give you my life history, all right, but it's, I know what I'm talking about. Um, very strongly with the tenor, which several different people have come up with, which is the place to look is at us, right? And that includes who charters our, our corporations and what, and what they are required to do for the country. It, it includes having an infrastructure that allows all sorts of things to be competitive, but we should be focused on what we can do, not what China is doing to us, right? 
And there's lots and lots of room and many different ways we can do that. Good, I see uh, Bill, uh, Bill uh, Murphy, you've had your hand up, you've been patient. Yes, thanks, John. I'd, I'd like to uh, ask Clyde, you know, he spoke, about, or many have spoken about the importance of uh, and desirability of, of incentives for, uh, for, for reshoring. And also uh, Clyde mentioned, you know, how er earlier in this process it became clear that US firms wanted to uh, not only sell overseas, but actually to produce there, and that the main advantage was avoiding U.S. Uh, regulatory and, and other costs. And I just wanted to know if Clyde thought it could be workable to perhaps have a uh, legislation that would require imports brought into the United States to meet US regulatory standards. This is an idea that Pete Morisi has suggested several years ago. I remember seeing an article, I think he may have limited it to environmental regulations, but the idea, underlying idea is that US firms were quite frequently reluctant to try to move overseas before the free trade agreements because they were afraid of political risk and, and other risks and th these free trade agreements really gave them substantial protection from, from that. Uh, and it ultimately created an incentive for them to more safely evacu evacuate the US. Could something like uh, Professor Marisi suggested work to both create incentives that would reduce the incentive of US firms to do outgoing FDI and also perhaps even create some reshoring? And would it be viable or workable? I, I very much think so, yes. I mean, let me just mention one idea that I've been trying to promote a little bit. Um, everyone agrees that climate change is a huge risk and that we need to do whatever is possible to mitigate it. Uh, this is something on which we in America and the rest of the world more or less agree. Now, what's interesting to me is that when economists run econometric models uh, to evaluate the effect of trade agreements. Uh, typically, they run the model, they assume full employment, um, they assume that there's no adjustment charges. And usually the model comes out showing that, hey, uh, another free trade deal is good for the economy. Uh, now, actually, the, the global supply chain system requires a lot of airplane shipping and a lot of ship shipping. And both of those are extraordinarily high in greenhouse gas emissions. So if you just cost it, uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emission cost of a supply chain and attribute that, uh, you know, impose that on the product that comes into the US, I think, you, I think you'd have a rush of of manufacturing back to the US. Absolutely. Um, it's easy to find other things that you could, uh, you know, other uncounted costs that you could throw into them. <clears throat> sure. Thank you. I, I see uh, Jim Fallis. Uh, uh, Jim, you were a salon speaker uh, on a China salon. Are you, you have a question for Clyde? Um, I, I am here and I'm uh, in a non camera mode, but I'm, I've been listening. <laughs> And so I had a, a question for Clyde, and Clyde, as you know, for decades, we've been uh, fellow laborers on these themes. And obviously, I'm really glad you're doing this book. I had one um, impressionistic question for you. In the years when Deb and I were living in China, our impression was that, China, as I mentioned on the chat, that China seemed most formidable the farther away you were viewing it, and most kind of fractured and contradictory and vulnerable up close. Whereas my impression is the reverse is true of the US. It seems most doomed at arm's length and most sort of resilient and creative um, the closer you get. That doesn't negate any of the things you say, which of course I agree with, but I just wonder, does that resonate with anything you've seen in the two countries? Uh, yeah, Jim, I, I pretty much agree with you on that. Um, one thing we didn't talk about tonight, but I think it's, it's significant is that we don't get in the U.S. Um, 
a, you know, a very clear picture of the real China. Um, the, I mean, as you know, right now, I think Keith Bradshaw is the only uh, journalist for a major US uh, 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 newspaper or, or magazine still in China. Um, we, we, we just don't, and I mean, everything, you know, we get the China Daily, we get the global tech, global uh, news and so forth, but that's all, of course, propaganda. I mean, what amazes me is that for a while I was getting the China Daily with my Washington Post, uh, paid for, I guess, by the United Front Work Department of the Communist Party. But so, you know, China makes a huge propaganda effort. Uh, we don't, and the effort we do make is kind of uh, spotty. Uh, and so I, I do agree with you that uh, that they, when you get closer, it doesn't look as formidable. Um, and I would say another thing too. I mean, we we're talking about you have to think of time frames. Um, you know, right now China is is soaring to a kind of a peak, but I mean, you already see birth rates in China are way down. China's going to start to lose people in about ten years, uh, like Japan. Uh, it'll probably be worse than Japan. It'll go faster in China than it has in Japan. Uh, and I mean, like Korea, I mean, like, like all of East Asia, really. Uh, and, and so uh, if you look at it over time, it's, it's not um, maybe as um, awesome as, as looking at it straight up front. But I think on the other hand, Jim, you know, there's no denying that, uh, I mean, when, when Eric uh, Schmidt says that China is... Uh, advancing faster in artificial intelligence than we are, I have to have some respect for that too. Yes, uh, th thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, Claude, I just had one quick question. Is it not possible though that we are overestimating Chinese power as we overestimated Japanese power in the 1990s and that the same, uh, same sort of phenomenon will happen with the Chinese overextension in terms of real estate leverage and so on and so forth that we're, we're and, they, and the fact that they've never had a recession in the past is it not possible that it's the same sort of phenomenon yeah uh two things what when you say japan i think you mean the 1980s i'm sorry 1980s yeah sorry and and i mean because i was uh one of those who thought that japan was we should be concerned about japan uh, i'll be defend myself a little bit and say you know i don't think japan was not a formidable challenger i mean uh, I walk outside today, all the cars I see are Japanese in my neighborhood. Nobody drives an American car uh, and I could go on. But um, I kind of look at it this way. I think that, yes, I think Ch China has no doubt weaknesses and, and problems. Uh, and Jim says we're only seeing it at a distance and we're seeing it propagandized. And so it may look bigger or stronger than it is. But, you know, Japan has 120 million people and China's got 1.4 billion. Uh, and Japan's economy was never more than about 70% of ours. And China is, if you look at purchasing power parity, it's already about 30% bigger than ours. If you look at exchange rate, it's still about 75% of ours, but it's going to grow 70% this year and we're going to be negative. Uh, so it's not going to be too long before China is as big an economy as we are. Uh, and um, so I, I think, you know, we, we shouldn't overplay it, but we shouldn't downplay it either. Okay. Clyde, what would you make of the idea that um, if people are in the globe uh, have countries, you know, to emigrate to, it seems like they would choose the United States over China. They have a free choice. What, what do you think explains why they would prefer the United States to China? Well, actually, I tweeted on this uh, earlier this week. Um, you need to be a follower of mine. Um, <laughs> we'll work on that. What I, said, what I said was that um, if you watch the way people travel, it tells you a lot about systems. And so in World War II, refugees went west. Uh, and in Korea, the refugees went south. Uh, in Hong Kong, the refugees are heading uh, to Europe, to the UK, and, and, and away from, from... Taiwan doesn't want to be part of mainland China. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I think the, the U.S. Uh, is, with all its warts and 
and uh, trial lines, the U.S. remains uh, a magnetic uh, place. I don't think China is, is magnetic for most of the world. However, having said that, um, what really strikes me is the extent to, uh, the extent to which human beings are willing to ignore um, evil or, or wrong uh, or bad, bad things uh, because they're making money. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the Aussie guy who told me, hey, we're not going to be with you guys that dust up in Taiwan. Well, he'd rather sell coal and he doesn't give a damn about Uyghurs or, or, or Hong Kong or anything like that. He just wants to sell his coal to Hong Kong, to, to China. Now, <laughs> his problem is maybe he's changing his mind now because the Chinese aren't buying his coal. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, Biden says he wants to pull together our allies. I think it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to put together a meaningful coalition of America and allies to somehow put pressure on China. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's kind of a waste of time. <clears throat> and, and as Chad says, the real problem is not them, it's us. <laughs> so, you know, we can do something about us, or we should be able to. <clears throat> but it's from what Chaz said, um, Clyde, that, you know, you, you remarked that it, you were stunned that human beings are readily capable of ignoring evil if they can make money. Yeah. But surely putting aside what, you know, you can talk about what the Chinese decided they don't have democracy or representative government there on Hong Kong, but Chaz described in Hong Kong, the economy is booming, well, liberty is shrinking. Uh, so the phenomenon is part of the human species. It's not Australia or US, it's everywhere. Yeah, I agree, you're right. Great, Chaz, so you have the last word here. What? Uh... <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Uh, but anyway, um, uh, I would say Confucius was asked by his disciples uh, about uh, 2,500 years ago, what is the nature of man? And he replied, gluttony and lust. I always thought he was, that was a defective answer because he did not mention greed, um, which Clyde did. Um, so Clyde, you get the Confucius Award for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, I think we need to be realistic. The latest Gallup polls of uh, international opinion about China and the United States show us on a par. Uh, as many people think we're a menace, as think we're the future, uh, and the same is true of China. Uh, and this goes back again to the point that we need to get our act together and we need to present ourselves more effectively uh, to the world. And I would not accept the thesis that whereas we once were, a, to quote an ancestor of mine, a city on a hill that attracted people uh, for our political beliefs, if our constitutional system is broken, if our liberties are in jeopardy, if our divisions overwhelm our unity, if we are less than we have the capacity to be, then we will get pe poor people from Central America coming here as immigrants in search of economic opportunity. But we will not get the world's most brilliant political minds, and we will not get its scientists and technologists and those who look to the future. So it all comes back to this. We need to get our act together. Well, thank you, um, uh, Chaz. And, and uh, Clyde is a, a great book. Uh, recommend everybody get it. And um, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for being yourself and writing the book and uh, helping us uh, focus on how we get our act together. Yeah. Thank you, John. You did a marvelous you, job, Clyde. Thanks. You can get great education for everybody. No way. Bravo, Thank Clyde. You. Good work, Bravo. John. Thank you, Clyde. All right. Bravo. Bye -bye. Thank you.